Hello, hello, and welcome again to a weekly Beatles talk show podcast called Things We Said Today. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the three regular co-hosts of this show, and you might know me from my other weekly Beatles show, which is a syndicated Beatles music program heard on over 25 stations right now called Every Little Thing. And I'm being joined by my two other regulars. First of all, the man who writes for Billboard, also Access.com, AXS.com, that is, and uh, Variety and lots of other publications. And that being Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. We're also joined by Alan Cozen, who for many years worked in the classical department at the New York Times, wrote articles for the Times in uh, in the classical field, still once in a while goes back and writes something for them, and also is a freelance writer, writes for the Wall Street Journal, has written a number of Beatle books, including The Beatles, From the Cavern to the Rooftop, and more recently, his ebook called Got That Something, How the Beatles' I Want to Hold Your Hand changed everything, and he's an all-round man about town, <laughs> our own... Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hello, Ken. Hello, everyone. And uh, we've been off for a couple of weeks, relaxing and watching lots of movies about the Beatles. And hopefully in the near future, we'll be talking about those movies right here on this show. And uh, for today's program, we're going to be catching up on a lot of news items and also discussing some of the major passings that took place in the last couple of weeks some real giants right there that uh, we'll be talking about. Steve, uh, I know that you just wrote an article uh, about uh, Mark Lewison and his book Tune In, and it's being reissued here in the States. Why don't you tell the folks about that? Well, the, the expanded two-volume version was never issued here. It was only available in England, and that was the only place you could get it if you wanted to get it, and a lot of American fans did. Um, and there's always been a you know a big demand for it, and his American publisher at the time of the publication didn't issue it, and uh, it's finally coming out. Uh, it's finally coming out here November seventh, and Mark told me um, in an email he said I'm delighted to be able to announce that the extended special edition is uh, he calls it the all I wrote version is finally going to be fully available in North America. He did say that uh, it's uh, thanks to his publishing partners, and uh, he said uh, the uh, Volume 2 has not been announced yet, and I know that's probably something we'd all like to know, but uh, he said this will kind of fill time between, you know, until Volume 2 comes along. But um, for those who don't have it, and a lot of people... You know, I would expect did not go over to, to uh, Amazon UK and order it. They will be able to get it here now. Hmm, that's definitely very good news. The date again is when? November seventh. Okay. It is. We there should you? probably point out it, it. Basically, his American publisher is importing them from Britain. Um, it says designed on the Amazon page. It says designed, printed, and bound in Great Britain. But they've never made it available domestically. You had to order it directly from Britain yourself, and it's more right. expensive uh, to do it that way. I mean, Amazon has it uh, at a list price of two hundred dollars, and they're selling it for one eighty four eighty six at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, and I bet know, you that'll that'll probably change. Right. Yeah. It's definitely worth it. I mean, I, I when they came out, I read them both. I read the short one first, and then I read the long one, and. Uh, I probably should have just read the long one. I, I guess I just wanted to know what the differences were. Mm-hmm. Um, but doing it that way was a little confusing because there were times when I thought, well, I, didn't he already say this? But, well, it, I probably read it in the other version. You know? mm-hmm. um, right. But the, the two-volume book, I mean, it has, you know, obviously – whole extra volumes worth of stuff, but also the footnotes that go with that extra stuff um, right. are, are crucial. And, uh, you know, if, you, if you're if you doing any work on the Beatles, writing any articles, anything like that, I mean, the two-volume book is the one to have, you know, that's got so much more information. Right. And, it's essential. Yeah, it really is essential for anybody that's a serious scholar of the Beatles. Um 
because and yeah, it's got not only it's got has it got more information. It's got uh, a lot of pictures that weren't in the uh, the smaller book. So, and 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 the one thing that I, I did not he did not tell me, and I did not see any inclination or any information on it is whether it'll be available in ebook form because it was available in ebook form in England. Right. So we'll see. We will see. That would be very nice because had the you know carrying the ebook version around with you uh you know yeah. is would be very handy so right. we should contact him directly to find out Amazon currently lists only hardcover right right hmm. yeah there was an ebook version in England so yeah but you want it on your shelf let's face it yes <laughs> yes you do. yes you absolutely do. essential book yeah All right, uh, another news item, and I know that I read uh, one of your articles, I think it was uh, about a week ago, perhaps, Steve, and there was an interview that you did with Bruce Sugar, who Mm -hmm. um, is the producer for Ringo's upcoming album, Give More Love, which is coming out September 15th, and in particular, you talked about the country track on there. Mm -hmm. Want to talk about that? Well, they... Just released pre- another preview track from Ringo's album called "So Wrong for So Long," and Bruce and I talked about this uh, um, extensively when I did my interview with him. And he said he really thought um, this would be uh, a possibility for country radio. Uh, he thinks that country radio might pick this up. Uh, it apparently is the first song that they had done. Uh, for the album because they had originally planned to make the uh, Give More Love uh, a country album. So this was the first song he and Dave Stewart did it. Uh, in, uh, uh, and so it, it's, it's a good song. I mean, it sound, it, it's very much like Boku for blue, you know, for blues. It sounds, sounds just like that. So, but um, it'll be interesting to see if country music picks it up. So. Well, Ringo sounds so comfortable doing that kind of music, mm-hmm. and you'd know that from listening to Buku's of Blues and certain country tracks throughout his, his solo career, like Crying, mm-hmm. which I thought was a fantastic song with a, a country feel to it. Yeah, and he just seems so at home. Uh, his voice really suits country music and mm-hmm. uh, more of a traditional country sound. And um, he did say that in the beginning he was thinking about making a country album. But then um, he got an offer for the All Star Band, that it led him right. back to L.A. So he he decided he's not going to stay. Wasn't that in? Wasn't it going to start in Nashville? Yeah. He, oh yeah. yeah. Uh, no, that's why I yeah, it said that they were going to go to Nashville and do a country album. That was the initial. That was the initial plan. And then when they decided to go on tour, that got sidetracked. So, but uh, the song itself is is is. is really good and it, you know there was an interesting comment on facebook the other day and i don't know uh, i don't know if you want to guys want to get into this extensively or not but somebody goes they thought ringo were was singing better than paul what do you guys think about that i thought that well i listened to the album today actually did you really <laughs> yeah it did occur to me that that um bizarrely enough at this point um ringo is the best singer of the surviving Beatles. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, I, I, you know, at first when I saw that, I kind of shrugged my, you know, I, I, I raised my eyebrows and then I thought about it and I go, you know, well, well might listen be- to the record, listen to the record. It's just Ringo's voice, the way it's always sounded. It's, there's, there's no wear on it at all. On the other hand, though, we're talking about Ringo's recorded voice versus Paul's live voice and I don't think there's a, that's a good comparison. I think well, when, when, there when was- we get Paul's, Go ahead. There was Paul's recorded voice on "Kisses on the Bottom." Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't count that yeah. as Paul as Paul's real recorded voice. Uh, I think okay. "New" is a better. I think "New" is a better example of that. You know, but I mean, there's no question that he sounds really good on the album. Mm-hmm. There's no absolutely none. Mm-hmm. Ken? Well, you know, we've talked about this before, but it, there really is no comparison between the two because Ringo's songs are not vocally challenging to sing. Okay. He sings songs that are in his range, so okay. he never has to strain for them, whereas Paul's songs are so much more vocally challenging. And, um, yeah, you should go back and listen to New 
And, you know, you, you listen to a rocker like Save Us or something like right. that. His voice is fine there. And then it also strains on early days. Wasn't you know, new a, a year before Kisses on the Bottom? No, I think Kisses on the Bottom came out before that. Right. Mm. I, I think so, so yeah. I think mm. so, too. I think so, too. So, and Kisses on the Bottom, you know, we can argue back and forth whether or not Paul was using his, what he called, Littler voice because he couldn't handle the vocals. But then he was so at home when he used his real voice on My Valentine or um, Only Our Hearts. His vocals were fantastic there. I don't, he should, I don't have, wanna... used, he should I... have used that voice a little bit mm-hmm. more on the album. Mm-hmm. And get yourself another fool as well. You know that's more his natural voice. And um, you know, let's let's face it, his his voice has deteriorated somewhat. But still, when you talk about the range that's required for most of his songs, especially live, you can't even compare that to mm-hmm. you know Ringo. Ringo also takes songs down in key. Yeah, and no, very I think, much so. I, I think Paul. I think Paul was really trying to do a Bing Crosby type croon on kisses on the bottom and and when he did it it just didn't work i think, oh, I don't I think know. i'm very used to it i really like his voice well i i no i'm just saying well i you know i've talked about i've said before what my feeling is i'm not gonna i don't want to go but i think that's what it was i think he was just trying to be a crooner and i'm not sure myself that that voice works for him but I, I mean, I, it, I don't want to take that. It's, it's a, it was a funny comment about Ringo singing better than Paul. I, you know, hmm. we won't, we, we'll, you know, we'll find out when Paul's album, uh, whenever it comes out, uh, come, you know, comes out. So. Okay, to take also, it from we'll a see. different point of view, Ringo is singing better than Ringo on this album. <laughs> I That's mean, there, true too. there are some places like in the remake of "Don't Pass Me By," which I don't think they have teased yet you know he sings that with a kind of laid-back finesse that uh is nothing like anything he's done in the past i mean it, it's 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 just uh he's taking his singing i think a bit more seriously than than he ever had i'm not saying he didn't take it seriously before but i mean there's there is some finesse here that i never noticed before in his work yeah. Who's ever working with him is doing a damn good job. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There we go. Well, the production, I think, is superb on the new album, which we'll be talking about, by the way, when it comes out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, we will. All right. So um, on we go with uh, a topic a few weeks ago This leaked out about Paul when he was attending LIPA, the Liverpool Institute for Performing Arts. He hinted that he would be writing a song about Donald Trump on his next album for which we don't we still don't have a release date so what do you guys think about that well i think i think you need to number one put it in perspective everybody i've seen stories uh saying it's definitely going to happen it might happen the story i did for billboard i kind of made it you know i kind of took it for what it was he made a comment saying sometimes the situation in the world is so crazy that you've got to address it. It doesn't necessarily say he's going to do anything, but it could very well. It could very well. So we'll see. Mm. And we, we already know that he was a Hillary supporter because he and Hillary were, Clinton were pictured together. So it would make sense that he would have something to say. So we shall see. We shall see. He also didn't deny it when all of the headlines were Paul's writing a song about donald trump on his new album so right um everyone did hedge it and say we don't know if it'll be positive or negative but you know look we know what paul's attitudes are we know what his feelings are and uh i think we know what it's going to be and we also have a hint from ringo because uh, in ringo's rolling stone interview i think last week they ask him about the song Laughable, which really kind of takes the same point of view. You know, I wake, I wake up and I see how crazy the world is and I just want to go back to bed. And um, they asked him, is that about Trump? And Ringo basically, again, didn't deny it. And he said, you know what, I, I'm not political. I do my political stuff other ways and I just sort of write these songs. But... You know, it, it seemed pretty clear that he was 
not – he was almost going out of his way not to deny it and not mm-hmm. confirm it. But Well, he, I mean Paul, Paul made a more direct comment to uh, uh, a writer uh, for the uh, Daily Telegraph in Australia. Yeah. He said, uh, he said, I'm not a fan at all. He's unleashed a violent – a kind of violent prejudice that is sometimes latent among people. He's unleashed the ugly side of America. People feel like they have got a free path to be, if not violent, at least antagonistic towards people of a different color or a different race. I think we all thought we'd got past that a long time ago. I mean, that's pretty clear how he feels. Yeah, I hadn't mm-hmm. seen that. When did he say that? He said that at the beginning. That's uh, at the beginning of July. I had that in my. In my Billboard article. So way before the whole That's... Charlottesville thing. Mm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Way yeah that was when he announced he was going to tour Australia. Mm. Right. Right. That mm-hmm. was where that came from. So, yeah, it's very, you know, there's no question of how he feels. Mm-hmm. So it's going to be, uh, it's going to be, the only question is whether or not he will actually be doing a song about Trump. And I and it looks you know from what Alan you're right he never he did not deny it so it'll yeah like you said Steve it'll be interesting if we know it's specifically about him he could write something that's a bit more generic you know like big boys bickering was mm-hmm. you right. know or even something like freedom which was a response to nine eleven without mentioning the terrorists so much right. but uh, did, you know didn't, it's, didn't the Rolling Stones do a, a Trump song. Or have they? Have they? Haven't they commented on him? No. Well, they Maybe. were angry that the Trump used. You can't always get what you want. Right. I, I yeah. remember that. I thought maybe they. No, I guess they haven't. I guess they haven't done anything with him. But okay. You know, anyway. Paul has been political at times. Oh sure. But, mm-hmm. but um, he's not afraid to be political. But at the same time, the question is: Will it be specifically about Trump? Right. And and obviously about him. Right. So we'll see. It we'll will see. be interesting. We'll see. Also, some other news about Paul is that um, not only is September 15th the release date for Ringo's new album, Give More Love, but the Foo Fighters have a brand new studio album coming out. And it was revealed that Paul is going to play drums on one of the songs. So being good friends with Dave Grohl, <laughs> Dave let uh, Paul play drums on one of the songs and... Uh, I always like hearing when Paul plays drums, mm-hmm. you know, not only on his own records, but it's fascinating to, to hear what he hears in his head, what fits. Um, you know, one of the most fascinating recordings from Paul as a side project was when he did My Dark Hour with Steve Miller, mm-hmm. which has some amazing drumming in there. Very interesting, as well as playing the bass on it and doing backing vocals. So when he, he works with other artists for their music, it's, it's interesting. You don't get to hear too much of Paul drumming, aside from, say, the first McCartney album or McCartney 2, uh, Band on the Run album, actually. Mm -hmm. Uh, Spies Like Us, certain songs like that. I love to hear Paul drum. I wish we'd hear more of it. So it'll be interesting just to hear this one song on uh, the Foo Fighters' new album. I hope he he gets a, a, a featured spot there. I hope it isn't buried in the mix. Probably won't be, though. Well, knowing the respect that Dave Grohl has for Paul, I doubt it's going to be buried. <laughs> right. mm-hmm. that's, that's true. That's true. All right, Alan, you had mentioned uh, the Rolling Stone interview with Ringo. Mm-hmm. Um, you want to talk a little bit more about it? Well, apart from the discussion of the song Laughable, um, he also was asked about uh, Sgt. Pepper, uh, in, in which he admitted big surprise that he liked hearing his drums out front more. Mm -hmm. Um, And they asked him whether there would be more archival sets like the Pepper set. And and he basically evaded a direct answer and and said that he would love there to be. Um, And I think he said especially the White Album and Abbey Road, and the interviewer said, well, what about uh, Rubber Soul and Revolver? And he said, yeah, why not? You know, I mean, he's being ever so slightly disingenuous here and that, you know, he's making it sound like he's just like us, hoping that maybe mm. it will happen, and who knows? But of course, 
you know, he would be intrinsically involved in any such decisions. And, um, and, and I've heard also elsewhere, I can't really reveal the source, but someone um, who deals with them a good deal told me that the White Album is definitely on you know, for, for next mm. year. So, uh, no idea what they're going to put on it. I, I couldn't get that much detail, but it, it basically confirms that when Giles Martin slipped in that British interview and said the next one will be the white album, uh, and then tried to cover it up and say, well, you know, it, it, it was what, what I meant was the white album was the next album they did. Um, <laughs> you know, but he said, will be, you know, so it, it basically confirmed that. I mean, it's in the works. So uh, looking forward to that already. <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't know why they get so – they have to be so secretive like that. I mean, you know. I don't know. It's people, so silly. I mean, it, it, it is. I mean, and, and they're not the only ones that do it. I mean, everybody does it. But in this particular case, I think, you know, you'd have a lot of people – really looking for you know i mean they were looking forward to pepper i mean uh, um you know looking forward to what's coming next year I d- it doesn't hurt to do that uh, it really doesn't and i really wish more people would just you know let go of that situation where everything has to be you know totally secret it's kind of it's kind of mm-hmm. Yeah, besides, now that so many of us are on pensions, it takes us longer to save up for these projects. So they really should should let us know as early as possible. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. And, you know, I don't know for a fact if they knew ahead of time that they'd be doing the White Album next. Because we were talking about this when Sgt. Pepper was coming out or before it, that I wish I knew what the record company was looking for in terms of sales. But I look at the Billboard charts all the time. And it's not like Sgt. Pepper has went all the way down the charts. It's still holding its own. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't have the sales figures, but it's done – it's very respectable mm-hmm. how well it's been doing overall. I mean most archival releases or new releases from veterans die a quick death after a couple of weeks, but Sgt. Pepper is still on there. Yeah. And like everything else, it also encourages sales of – their back catalog and you'll see the Beatles one on the charts and you'll see Abbey Road on the charts. And so, you know, it, it's been a good sign ever since. I think the sales have been healthy enough for the record company and for Apple to say, okay, next project, <laughs> right. you know, let's move on. So, but maybe that's why they don't want to tell us. Maybe they don't want to stifle the sales of the back catalog because if everyone thinks that there's going to be box sets coming out of all of these other records, they won't go buy them now. Hmm. That's a good point. Never thought about that. Mm. Okay. All right. Let's move on to uh, some sad topics here because in the last couple of weeks, we've lost some major figures in uh, the entertainment world. And uh, as we're doing this show on August the 21st, yesterday we learned of the passing of comic legend Jerry Lewis. And um, Jerry, obviously, as a Beatle fan, you think of – when it comes to connections with Jerry Lewis, obviously, when John and Yoko and Elephant's Memory performed on his muscular dystrophy uh, telethon in 1972. But then again, Ringo was also on the telethon. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was in 1979. He actually performed at a band with Todd Rundgren and uh, members of Utopia, as a matter of fact. And hmm. uh, uh, Bill Wyman was in the group as well and uh dave mason and they did three songs live and um you know so you had that and actually ringo did he was on the phone ringo was on the phone taking pledges <laughs> during the telethon too which was a pretty cool thing mm-hmm. yeah and, really? uh paul was never on the telethon uh performing live but he did submit a video for getting closer and that was in 1979, the year of Back to the Egg. So it was the same year that Ringo was on. And George was the only one that was never – he never contributed anything to to uh, the MDA. Hmm. So as far as Beatle connections, you know, that's where you go from there. Any thoughts at all about um, the passing of Jerry Lewis? How about you, Steve? He was a great uh, comedian. And I was – one of the things I was – I dug up last night uh, – 
uh, on YouTube was the uh, reunion between him and Dean Martin uh, on the telethon that Frank Sinatra mm. orchestrated. That was uh, one of the best moments in television ever, and I I watched that like uh, a couple of times last night because it's uh, it was such a cool moment. But uh, I mean, he was you know there isn't a whole lot you can say as far as you know uh, you know as uh, what he was i mean he was he was one of the, he was the he was a comic legend back in the 50s that's the way it was i mean he was you know he and dean martin were the biggest entertainment one of, one of if not the biggest entertainment duo in those mm. years period right yeah were you a fan <laughs> i think i was a little a little young then a little young Oh, okay, little... no, but you could have been a fan for his, oh, his solo was, films. Oh, uh, sure, yeah. I was a fan. Oh, yeah, I liked his, I liked the solo films. I liked the solo films. I liked I liked Dean too, but uh, yeah, I liked the solo films. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. How about you, Alan? Yeah, for me, the uh, you know the the main interest of of Jerry Lewis at this point in my life is the Beatles connections, and in particular the you know the John and Yoko clip um, just recently turned up on a uh, a bootleg, um, an HMC bootleg in color, yeah. um, and which you know a sort of very low quality black and white ones had been floating around you know with the phone numbers on them and and everything that you would have seen at the time and the color clip came out and doesn't have any phone number superimposed or anything. And, uh, it's really interesting to see in that quality, but you know, I mean, I, I liked Jerry Lewis as a comedian when I was a little kid and, uh, somehow didn't really maintain that interest very much. I mean, it, it, to me, it, it just seemed sort of more like, silly comedy than thoughtful comedy and uh you know I, i'm sure that if i revisited some of the w- films i liked when i was a kid um i might still find them funny in a nostalgic kind of way but uh i sort of went on to other things i suppose and uh so yeah not 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 really a a, a great jerry lewis fan as an adult but was as a kid mm yeah. By the way, we should mention, uh, for those of you that don't know, when John and Yoko and Elephant's Memory were on the show, they performed Imagine, and they also did Yoko's song, Now or Never, mm-hmm. and uh, Give Peace a Chance. Mm-hmm. And also, mm-hmm. if you're wondering what Ringo did with that that early all-star band, and actually, you know, we talk about Todd Rundgren a lot. That's where the relationship started with Todd and Ringo was on that show because they hadn't worked together before that. So um, they had done um, Money and also um, Jumpin' Jack Flash and I believe Twist and Shout with a great lineup right there. So as for me, uh, I just want to say, and I'll try and make this brief, but Jerry Lewis is probably one of the top three people in the world that I admired the most because I've always been fascinated with people who have had multiple careers And in in many ways, uh, there's a parallel here between Jerry Lewis and the Beatles, because Jerry Lewis started out with Dean Martin, and they were the biggest thing in comedy. They were like the the comedy, you know, they were the equivalent of the Beatles. And I've heard some people say that in in the wake of Jerry's passing, because they were so huge. For 10 years, they were the biggest comedy duo, and they churned out 16 or 17 films. They had girls screaming after them. Girls waiting outside their hotel room, you know, that kind of thing. The same kind of mania that the Beatles had, and also Frank Sinatra and Elvis, too. But then they broke up, and a lot of people were disappointed about it. But then they each went out and carved out their own careers and had so much success on their own. And Mm -hmm. kind of like there's a lot of people that I speak to, you know, in all the years that I've been doing my radio work on the Beatles that discovered the Beatles first through the solo music. I didn't know anything about Martin and Lewis growing up as a kid in the 60s, but I was in the movie theater when The Nutty Professor was in there, was was a new film, and I knew Jerry Lewis's uh, wacky, zany, slapstick comedy and loved it back then. And, uh, and then I also sometimes, as a little kid, watched Dean Martin's TV show mm-hmm. and heard his, his hits in the 60s. He had a lot of hits, you know? Everybody Loves Somebody was number one. Right. And, uh, and then, of course, there's also the Dean Martin roasts, 
And then from there, Jerry Lewis also, he was 44 years, they said, that he did the telethon. And actually, he did more work than that because the his work with the with MDA started during the Martin and Lewis years. And Dean Martin was involved, too, from what I understand. And so you think about all the work that he did for that cause. And they say he raised two and a half billion dollars for that cause. He had an amazing career. And I can think of because I always bring up the solo careers of the Beatles and how I'm just amazed at how well they did, and you know, for the four of them, what other group has had the kind of success as solo artists coming from a band where each member had success? And Martin Lewis was the same way. You know, mm-hmm. they had amazing success on their own to the point that there are some people who grew up with Jerry Lewis on his own and Dean Martin on his own without knowing about their beginnings. And that's pretty remarkable when you consider how big Martin and Lewis were, too. So, right. you know, there are similarities there. I do see a parallel, you know. I can't think of any duo or entertainment act where every member had a lot of success on their own. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you can't say that about other comedy teams, really. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I just thought that I would make that, that parallel there. Okay. You know. Anyway, so uh, we move on to another great person that we lost, and that being Glenn Campbell, who had such a career. I mean, you talk about multiple careers. He started out doing studio work as part of the L.A. Wrecking Crew. He was on hundreds, hundreds of hit records. You probably wouldn't even know it. You'd have to see a whole discography of everything that Glenn Campbell was on. Mm-hmm. And um I bring up Glenn because, well, first of all, you and Steve actually found out because, you know, uh, the uh, video for Get Back and Don't Let Me Down premiered on Glenn's own TV show, The Good Time Hour. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. April 30th, 1969. Right. So that's a part of history right there. There are some Beatle connections. I mean, he was a big Beatle fan. He covered Beatle music going back to 1965, the early part of his career when – under his own name, he wasn't a big name at all. He was a session guy. And, he, also, uh, he also played with the Beach Boys. Right. He, so. he um, filled in for Brian Wilson. In mm-hmm. fact, after Glenn passed away, there was an article in Rolling Stone where Brian Wilson commented about Glenn and said that he could sing better than the Beach Boys, than any of the Beach Boys. And, um, you know, all the praise about him being such an amazing musician. That same article in Rolling Stone, Leon Russell said that he was the best guitarist he had heard then and since. Hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's high praise. I mean, they worked together. Mm-hmm. You know, Leon was part of the Wrecking Crew, too. So, uh, you know, back in 1965, I know that Glenn uh, covered Ticket to Ride. He covered Beatles songs on his own show. In fact... Uh, you being the Big Monkeys fan, Steve, mm-hmm. Glenn covered Hello, Goodbye in a comedy sketch with the Monkeys. Right. And Pat Paulson. Pat Paulson. And I think Jack Burns from uh, Burns and Schreiber. Hmm. I think he was in that, too. So, uh, yeah. And uh, he covered Beatles songs through the years. but He did yesterday as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And... Uh, in 2005, I had one of the greatest honors, I think, in my career. I interviewed Glenn Campbell when I was a producer at the ABC Radio Networks. And very often, they would give me people to interview that fell under the category of oldies or classic rock. And um, Glenn was in New York at the time. He was doing uh, some shows with Jimmy Webb um, at Feinstein's. In New York, and he really didn't have anything like a new CD to promote or a new DVD. But because of the power of the company that I worked for, we got a lot of big names in there. And usually, they would ask me to do simple interviews with song setups where the artists would talk about their hits. So we needed a 30-second soundbite of Glenn talking about Wichita Lyman. That's what they wanted me to do. But because of my work on the Beatles, if I could slip in a Beatle question, I always tried to do that. And on my show, Every Little Thing, I used to play this cover version of a Paul McCartney song that Glenn did. And um, I thought that I would play that clip right here on the show. So we go back to this interview that I did with Glenn Campbell. 
And uh, again, this is back in 2005. Speaking of covers, I want to bring up one more because I'm a big Beatle fan and I've oh. done radio work on, on, on the Beatles. And you made an album, which I brought with me, <laughs> where you covered a song that most people don't even dare cover. Which one? Mull of Kintyre. Oh, yeah. Which, um, for those that don't know, became the biggest hit single in the UK of all time up to that point for Paul McCartney. Mm -hmm. And over here, wasn't played at all. No. The flip side was played. It How never did... was a single, I don't think. No, it was a single here. The flip what? side called Girl School got airplay here. Oh. But over in the UK, this, this was the monster. It was the biggest selling single. Yeah. Surpassing She Loves You from the Beatles. How did you discover Mull of Kintyre and what led you to record it? Because I was on tour over there and that was number one the whole time I was over there. And uh, I bought me a set of bagpipes and <laughs> said I want to learn it. And that's why I did it. Isn't that a great piece of material? Oh, yeah. I do Mull of Kintyre and Amazing Grace in the shows. They used to. I, but pipes are just so damn hard to, you know, keep in tune. I shut the drones off years ago, <laughs> just so you play the chanter, you know. Yeah, I, the bagpipes I thought were very difficult, and and well, you played are. it on, on there. Yeah, i How fast did you learn? Well, it's just like it's just like a tin whistle. The chanter is very easy to learn, but it was just something I wanted. In fact, this, that's why I bought pipes for Mullican tire. I said I can do that, <laughs> and it. When I do it, it just gets such a huge response. You still do it now? I haven't done it in a while. I'm going to go back, though. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going back now to the songs that get the real big response. <laughs> Did you do that with Amazing Grace as a medley? <clears throat> or was it just two separate no, songs? just two separate songs. Okay. Well, I was very impressed, and I've played this on the air. Oh, really? Thank yeah. you. Yeah. It's a good I record. It. Man. Yeah. I, I didn't do it. I didn't really set it as a single. I said it on the album, but I, it was just such a good piece of material to have in your album you know and hey i did it justice anyway mm -hmm. i did a little bit different than mccartney i played the pipes <laughs> so there's glenn campbell talking about covering mull of kintyre paul mccartney's song um alan what'd you think of the clip it was really interesting i mean it 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 gives you a sense of his musicianship in a way other than you normally see i mean a lot of people have have commented on what a great guitarist he was and 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 you know that from his session work and, and even from his guitar playing on his albums but the idea of taking up the bagpipes specifically really to do mull of kintyre and bagpipes mm. are as as he he kind of talks about in the clip that you know they're they're kind of tough you know and if, if you're only playing them now and then um it's it's you know tough to maintain you know it's it's a it's a it's a strange sound and there's the bellows and you know all kinds of things you know i i suspect i mean he doesn't really talk much about it but campbell is a scott's name i mean he may have um he may have felt some kinship with the idea of the bagpipes and Mull of Kintyre as a song, I think, mm. you know, maybe going back a few generations. I mean, people tend to sometimes like revisiting their roots. And, yeah. uh, you know, the funny thing is I, I, I still have not heard his studio recording of Mull of Kintyre, but I've heard a live recording that is out there on YouTube. And it really is extraordinary. I mean, he, he, he sings it fantastically and mull of kintyre isn't a song that i would imagine a lot of people cover i mean it, it seems very personal to paul in a way you know what i mean mm -hmm. i mean it's not that it's not coverable or anything i mean it, but hearing what glenn campbell did with it i i i was really impressed with that and uh came to it late and i'm still looking for the studio one so i'll catch up with that at some point but, but well, I'll, I'll send you an mp3 <laughs> <laughs> okay it was on his album called Old Hometown, which came out in 1982. Mm -hmm. And Steve, you must have been pleased because I know Mull of Kintyre is a favorite of yours. Yeah, well, I, the, the Glenn Campbell is not the person I would have ever conceived to <laughs> cover that song. Uh, it's it, and you know it just shows what a talent he was, uh, what an incredible talent he was. I think I think a lot of people were swayed by or or. or you know, kind of paid attention to things like Gentle on My Mind and, you know, and, and, and those songs and didn't see that there was more of a, a reach to his his talent, you know. Um, I think we all kind of 
um, forgot about his, for example, his beat work with the Beach Boys, uh, and it was that was very extensive. Mm-hmm. But yeah, he. I mean, he was he was an exceptional talent. There's no, there's no question. But yeah, the whole idea, the idea of him covering Mull of Kintyre, surely must have hit a few people, you know. And like, really, Glenn Campbell. But it just goes to show that he was such a great talent. Uh, so. Yeah, and also um, a few years later, he released an album on Capitol Records called "Meet Glenn Campbell," and on that album. He covered "Girl Old with Me," and it was a really fine cover, mm-hmm. which I played on my show too, which everyone should check out. You can find it on YouTube. But um, you know, ever since Glenn's passing, I've been watching some of his TV show, and it's an amazing thing to watch because this guy could do just about anything, and he was an incredible guitar player, and he sang. That's another thing about Glenn Campbell, I I just have to say, because one of the things that I remember most of all about my interview with him, well, actually, uh, well, there's a couple of things, but I wanted to to make a point to say to him that I thought that he really is a great singer, because nobody ever gives him credit for being an amazing vocalist. Mm -hmm. And if you listen to just the hit songs that he sang on, especially the Jimmy Webb songs and Galveston and songs like those, his, his his range is great and powerful. And mm-hmm. if you've ever watched that TV show, and I do hope that the entire series comes out, because you're going to see a man that really, not only could he play the guitar like anything, but he sang with the best of them. He sang alone so many great songs, and he sang with the guests. And he played guitar with some great guitar players, too. He had Jerry Reed on his show as a regular. And, uh, you know, towards the end of the show, there'd be a jam session and it was fantastic to watch Glenn Campbell and Jerry Reed together. But, um, you know, he sang with the best of them. He sang with people with great singing voices like Liza Minnelli, you know. And um, not only that, but he sang so many different genres of music. If you watch that show, it's not just the pop stuff. He fell, obviously, very easily into the country field. He did a lot of show tune music, too. Mm-hmm. Um You know, there was one, I'm just going to say this one song that blew me away, which is a Jimmy Webb song, which is very well known to people because it's kind of like a standard, which is Didn't We, which was a song that Frank Sinatra recorded, Uh, Richard Harris, who of course did MacArthur Park, the Jimmy Webb song. But um, listen to Glenn Campbell sing that song, if you can find it on YouTube or whatever. He was amazing. He was an incredible singer. But when I brought that up to him, he really downplayed it. And he made it seem like he was a guitar player that just got lucky. Hmm. And it really upset me when he, when he talked that way. And the people who worked for him, who are in the studio opposite with me, as I'm saying this to him, they're shaking their heads. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. you know, why is he saying this? Watch that show. He was an incredible singer. Listen to his music, you know. No one can deny how great he was as a guitar player. But uh, he was a really fantastic singer. And the other thing that I just want to say is that he was diagnosed, well, publicly it was announced that he had Alzheimer's in 2011. When I interviewed him in 2005, I knew there was something wrong with him. I didn't know what it was, but there were a number of times when he couldn't finish a thought or finish a sentence. And whenever that happened, he would doodle on the guitar and use it as a crutch. But he was as nice as can be. I mean, so professional in the interview. And, you know, like I said, it, one of the greatest honors of my career was interviewing him. So, um, yeah, it was it was it, it was funny that the 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 show was a summer replacement for the Smothers Brothers. So right. they really didn't have any have any plans to um, to make a you know big deal out of it, and it just it took off on its own. I think we you know um, anyway. I he was a, he was a great a great guy. So. Mm-hmm. Also, we know the passing of Dick Gregory, mm-hmm. and. Um, Alan, you wanted to say his big, uh, you know, connection. Well, his big Beatles, Beatles connection was uh, he he got to know John and Yoko um, around sixty nine, sixty eight, maybe, and uh, he turned up at the uh, Montreal Bed Inn uh, where they recorded "Give Peace a Chance." He was there the day they recorded "Give Peace a Chance," and and he's 
on the record. I mean, you, you don't really hear him like you don't hear anybody there, but, uh, you know, individually except John. But he's in that big chorus of uh, visitors and celebrities and you name it. I had thought, and I I haven't been able to put my finger on the info, but I had thought that he was instrumental in getting John and Yoko's Two Virgins album put out in the U.S. Um, as you may recall, EMI didn't really want to do it. Um, right. And so it ended up being distributed here on an Apple label, but it was actually manufactured and distributed by Tetragrammaton Records, um, which was Bill Cosby's label. But somehow or other, I thought that Dick Gregory was involved in that transaction somehow, maybe put Cosby onto it or or whatever. Yeah. Hmm. Was he in any way involved with, with John more politically that you're aware of? Being um, the civil rights activist that he was and all? Well, you know, politically, obviously, they saw eye to eye and they uh, would have had, you know, when he was visiting him during the bedding, I mean, he didn't just turn up to sing on the song. They, John was basically holding open dialogues and Dick Gregory would have been a, you know, a perfect person for him to have this kind of dialogue with. And, uh, you know, as opposed to some other people who turned up there like Al Cap, um, <laughs> where they were, you know, totally at odds with each other. I mean, Dick Gregory and, and, and John and Yoko sort of, you know, were on the same page. And, uh, mm-hmm. um, but I'm not aware of the relationship extending that much further. I mean, that doesn't mean that it didn't, you know, we're not sort of up on what all of their relationships were that, you know, that weren't public. Um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if they had kept in touch through, you know, the rest of John's life and even, you know, maybe with Yoko afterwards. Hmm. Okay. Any thoughts at all, Steve? No, I mean, other than the fact that he was a great um, spokesman, uh, you know, um, for all things uh, uh, civil rights uh, back in the 60s, uh, you know, it's it's a, it's a tragic loss. Um, it, it's too bad we didn't hear a lot from him in the past year or two. Um, but, uh, I'm I'm sorry to hear that he's gone. He he was a he was a great name, especially in the sixties. Yeah. Mm. All right, since we have a little bit uh a little bit of time left in the show, I wanted to ask the two of you a question that I've been wondering about for a while. On the very first Ed Sullivan broadcast, at the very end of the show, he's promoting the fact that the Beatles are gonna be on the next show. And I was wondering, since I'm sure you were watching back then. Did, oh, <laughs> was it known amongst the fans that early on that they were going to be on for three shows in a row? Or was yes. it news? Was it news only at the end of the show? No, it was known. They There's a press release. I have a copy of the original press releases uh, that CBS issued. And I published way back in, the, you know, years and years ago, they were on the uh, and they still should be on the Abbey Road site, but yeah, they knew. Uh, everybody knew. They CBS announced well beforehand that they were going to have them on three nights. Okay, I wasn't aware of that. You know. mm-hmm. Okay. Do you remember yeah. that at all, Alan? Um, my memories of that period are really kind of vague. Um, I I kind of think that I knew, but I'm not really absolutely sure. Uh, I think. I watched the Ed Sullivan show every week, so I would have run into them whether I knew it or not. But I, I, I suspect that that it was was known, was published. Uh, you know, I mean, as, as a nine year old, I wasn't a big newspaper reader or billboard right. reader where it would have been reported. And right, um, I mean, that and that's the important thing that you know, neither, neither of us were like we are now. Right, and, and you know. Uh, so, I'm just going but, by your memories, but, whatever you, whatever memories they may be. Well, my personal personal memory, I probably I probably didn't know, but it was announced. CBS mm. did not, did announce in advance that they were going to have uh, them th- uh, three weeks in a row. So that wasn't, you know, uh, it, it may have announced it and maybe have surprised some people, 
at the time, but it was it was out there, and it's very possible that you know it was in newspapers in the day, and and you know possibly mentioned on TV. But uh, it it was not a, it was not a surprise that he that he mentioned at the end of the show. Okay, all right. I have one thing I can mention. Take a minute or two. Um, here in in Portland, there's 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 one uh, slight Beatles thing up, um, which is I I don't know if you you may recall I've I've mentioned uh, that there's an annual Beatle night here uh, mm-hmm. at, at the State Theater, which is one of the big theaters where a lot of pop concerts are held um, here in Portland, and every year. They have this Beatles night, and now it's sort of like a Beatles weekend. And in the past, it's been basically sort of one show, and it's been repeated like the next day. And it's usually around Thanksgiving. This year, they just announced it. I think it's like November 23rd, 4th, and 5th. I'll I'll check again as it gets closer. Um, And what they're doing this year is on a Friday night, they are playing all of Revolver plus a bunch of other stuff, you know, hmm. after it. Saturday night, they are playing all of Sgt. Pepper and a bunch of other stuff. And then I think the Sunday afternoon concert is uh, just, you know, a mixed repertory from all over the the catalog. And and they play solo and group stuff when they do these things. Uh, I, I went a couple of years ago when they played all of Abbey Road. The group that does this is really impressive. They bring together um, a lot of people from the sort of local groups that perform here. And there's, there is a, a very active music scene here. And it's run by a guy named Spencer Alby, who's released maybe three or four albums um, and is, you know, really a Beatles fanatic. I mean, his own stuff... It's, you wouldn't really necessarily say it's beatle but it's rooted in classic rock. And he is in charge of the ensemble, and they do a great job. And uh, so I'm really looking forward to that. Comes end of November. Okay. Oh. All right. <laughs> if we need Steve, you've got, you've got a news item there? Well, I've, I, I actually, it's more like an anecdote. I recently interviewed... Ann Moses, um, and if the name doesn't sound familiar, maybe if you read Tiger Beat, you will recognize the name. She was editor of Tiger Beat for a number of years, and she dealt with a lot of teen idols. She had close contact with a lot of teen idols, uh, Paul Revere of the Raiders, the Monkees, Bobby Sherman, you name it. Anybody back in those days, um, she had a Dave Clark Five. Did I say Dave Clark Five? She's Dave Clark Five. She, she had contact with a lot of people. And although her book, the one of the thing, obviously I asked her about the Beatles, and she didn't have much contact with the Beatles. However, she did see the Beatles at Dodger Stadium, and she told me an interesting story. She because uh, she said she sat in the front row of the Revolver press conference the day before the show. Uh, this was in sixty five, uh, uh, sixty six. Yeah, but anyway, she went to. I'm sorry. She went to Hollywood Bowl in '65. That's what it is. My notes are all confused. But her her brother and a friend of hers, a friend of her brother's, who um, said they wanted to sign up as rent a cops, and so they got to be rent a cops uh, for the Rolling Stones. And later, they were uh, they guarded the Beatles also. And so what they did was they gave the, the guys badges with their last names on them. So her brother's last name was Moses, and it turns out her friend's last name was Christ, C-H-R-I-S-T. And so apparently the story went around, or either – I can't remember if she said they said – the Beatles said it or the story went around that Moses and Christ guarded the Beatles. <laughs> so there. Nice little anyway. anecdote. Nice yeah. little anecdote, and it's a great book, by the way. It's available on Amazon. It's called "Meow: My Groovy Life with Tiger Beats Teen Idols." <laughs> it is a fun, very funny book. Very, very interesting. She had, like I said, she had contact with the Dave Clark Five. In fact, that was the first first group she had contact with. Um, it, it, it was. Uh, I mean, everybody is mentioned in there. The Monkeys. Uh, Tiger Beat was big on the Monkeys. 
there was a whole lot of stuff in there. And by the way, speaking of Dave Clark Five, I happened to run across a clip on YouTube the other day. The old TV show to tell the truth puts out vintage episodes that you can see for free. And the one they put out the other day was the winner of a contest who got to meet the Dave Clark Five. And it's very it's a, it's a, it's a it's the opening of the show. It's very cute because I I didn't guess who it was, but uh, it's it's and there's a picture of her uh, at the end of the uh, or at the end of the segment with the Dave Clark Five, and she and and it was funny. She asked which one that she likes the best. She liked the best, and it was Dave. None of them mentioned nobody, and a couple of the the panelists mentioned members too. Nobody mentioned Mike Smith, who I thought would have been the the obvious choice because he had the Paul McCartney resemblance. But anyway, and he sang most of the lead vocals. And he sang most of the lead vocals, right? Yeah, exactly. Hmm. All right. Well, this has been a fun show. Uh, we're just going to give out our own contact information, and we're going to start with Steve. You can get a hold of me at BeatlesExaminer at gmail.com. I'm on Facebook, and I have a Beatles News and Information group uh, that I post uh, all sorts of things to all of the time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Alan? Oh, the easiest way to get to me is through Facebook as well, either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Okay. We also have our own Twitter account here. What's the address there, Steve? Uh, things we said fab as for me Ken Michaels my email address is everylittlething at att.net and don't forget to check out my website every week every day if you can at kenmichaelsradio.com amongst the new prizes that I have to give away on my Beatles trivia page I have the brand new DVD for The Change Begins Within charity concert for the David Lynch Foundation, which took place at Radio City Music Hall in 2009. Paul and Ringo performing, Eddie Vedder, Cheryl Crow, Donovan, Paul Horn, lots of good people. Jerry Seinfeld was part of the, uh, of the concert. So that's right there on my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com. All right. This has been great. Thanks to all of you for listening. Keep the comments and suggestions coming to our email address and also to we didn't mention our facebook page which is things we said today also we have another one mm -hmm. things we said today radio fans mm -hmm. so you can write to us there as well so thanks so much for listening for steve marinucci and alan cozen i'm ken michaels saying thanks for tuning in and we will see you next time mm -hmm.